Good evening, everyone. Giving everyone here a chance to get on, get signed in. It is uh, January the 4th, Thursday night, 7 p.m. Bible study. And uh, it's another good day. Praise God that we have another, another evening together looking at the Word of God. Appreciate all the people of God. I might start off saying that it would be good if we um, would remember to pray for Sister Chelsea and Brother Phil Fisher, who just had their baby, I believe it was Monday night. And, um, of course, the baby <clears throat> is still in the hospital, but Sister Chelsea's got to go home, but they're able to go up there every day with it. And uh, But they do need our prayers. Pray that the baby, you know, God would touch this child and, and uh, help them. She has some health issues, and so we certainly want God's touch. Also, Sister Abraham is in the hospital having treatment, uh, and she needs our prayers also. Brother Michael and Sister Cindy Smith both have COVID-19. Both of them are doing good, doing very well. Uh, I think Michael's basically over it. He just has to stay quarantined for several more days. And then Sister Cindy, uh, she's, she's actually doing better. She has lost her sense of taste and smell, I believe, and she had a little different reaction. She had, uh, it affected uh, her eyes, uh, light, her eyes became very sensitive to light, and uh, she's had headaches and just been, you know, tired, exhausted, I believe, but not, you know, not real, real sick. And uh, I think she's doing better coming out of it. So we want to continue to pray for them. Um, anyway, uh, God bless all of you. Um, I, um, if you would turn to Psalms, the 19th chapter, I would like to say something in that uh, chapter of Psalms tonight. <clears throat> that, that chapter has to do really with the coming of the Lord in the end of the Jewish world, the harvest of that world, and it also would apply to the harvest of the Gentile world, the end of our world. I think it might be fitting to mention that uh, the first coming of the Lord, of course, he came personally uh, as a child. Uh, took on the the form of mankind, a human spirit, and uh, uh, the human nature, so that he could be like his brethren and experience uh, what we experience and be the example of how to be reconciled to God or and to. Uh, go through the process of being reconciled to God through the covenant that God made with him, uh, the new covenant. And so I think it's that's important to understand and it's important to know that uh, th that, that coming back there, God harvested uh, that world. And I'm using that term because it's a biblical term. If you remember Jesus Jesus told his disciples, uh, say not until it's, uh, that it's four months till the harvest. For the harvest, uh, for the fields are white and ready to harvest. Uh, and uh, I've mentioned this before that uh, that harvest back there. God was harvesting that world. We have scriptures to show that there's going to be a harvest down here. And so that would be the, the second coming of the Lord 
a lot of people have it in their ideas. And of course, I was taught this out in religion in the Pentecostal world before I came to the body of Christ. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, that, uh, that Jesus was only going to come once for the church and that he was coming to catch the church away in the rapture. And, and, um, you know, it wasn't explained that well. And we, I didn't really understand it that well, but I believed it. But I've since, you know, uh, become far more knowledge of the word of God. And, and I understand now that Jesus came to that. He first came individually or as a human and was the sacrifice for all of us. But he also overcame sin for himself. <clears throat> Hebrews, the fifth chapter says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered and being made perfect. Jesus wasn't perfect. He had, he was suff he tempt he was tempted. If you read the second chapter of Hebrews and the fourth chapter, you'll see that he was tempted in every point that we're tempted in. And, uh, that he he was he went through that temptation. There's no such thing, by the way, as a templess temptation. The templess temptation would be where you were tempted, but you weren't tempted. <laughs> I mean, if you were tempted, you wanted to do wrong. That's that's just the way it is. Every man is tempted, James said, <clears throat> when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So that's where temptation comes. It It's in your mind. You're drawn away of lust, desiring, having a lustful spirit of wanting to do something that you shouldn't do. Jesus was tempted, just like the first man, Adam, was tempted. And But Jesus never gave in to his temptation, and he overcame that nature, the human nature of having a will to do his own will. See, God, God doesn't want a, a people uh, that he has to make to be righteous. He wants a people that chooses to be righteous. Listen to what uh, Paul said in Hebrews, the first chapter. Uh, he said, uh, because he, this is God talking to Jesus, because Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, uh, has blessed you with the uh, above thy fellows, uh, with the joy of 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 of, uh, of the morning. Let's let's let me read it to you because I ain't getting it quite right. I'm close, but I'm not quite there. So Hebrews, the first chapter, and verse nine, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. There it is. The oil of gladness is understanding. All in the Bible is is typified of understanding the oil that went in the sevenfold lamp in the holy place gave light. That's what light is. You can see you've got understanding. The oil of gladness, uh, when you understand God's plan fully, you it will make you glad. Uh, above thy fellows, you were anointed with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Uh, and so, uh, what does it say? And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. It's talking about Jesus. God created Jesus, and he created everything else that was created according to God's word, how God wanted him to do it. 
They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall act old, old as doth the garment. Um, so uh, uh, Jesus was, he, he, he loved righteousness, and he hated iniquity, and therefore he came it. He overcame it, and he never gave in to it. And though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. In other words, God take, took him through the suffering of temptation, let him experience the what's on this earth that's corrupt and evil. He suffered all of that. For you and I, he came to this world and gave up his place in heaven and uh, was, was made a human and grew up as a child. And finally, uh, when he was 30 years old, he started his ministry. But then when he died on the cross and became the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us, that Passover lamb, that, the picture of the Passover that was, Moses was given uh, before they came out of Egypt, that, that everyone had to have eat the Passover feast. They had to apply the blood of the Passover to their the lintel of their door and their doorpost. And uh, that's, that's a picture that we've got to be, the blood of Christ has got to be applied to our lives, else death overshadows us. There's no hope for life outside of Christ. The wages of sin is death and the gift of God is life eternal. And so, we we have to have the the door of our heart. Uh, it's got to be uh, the the blood of Christ has got to be applied to it. Jesus was our example. He overcame uh, his will. He did the will of his Father, and um, and he it made him glad to have the understanding of God's plan. That's that. and so. Um, uh, let's go back to the 19th chapter now, but before I continue, I mean, before I read down, I want to continue to mention how that that world back there, there was a harvest back there. Remember Jesus said, um, uh, how did he say it in Matthew? He said unto his disciples, the harvest is truly, is is truly truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. He told them to pray for labors. Um, so he he was talking about God harvesting that world. He'd been working with them for two thousand years and getting them prepared for Jesus to come in the end of that world. It's it's in the end of a world that God finally finishes His work. There was the Jewish world, and now we're in the end of the Gentile world. So he said, uh, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into the harvest. And so <clears throat> I'm just showing you that it is scriptural to call it a harvest. Jesus came on the day of Pentecost. Remember in the 14th chapter of St. John, he told his disciples, uh, he began to tell them he was going to send them a comforter. The entire 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th chapter of the book of St. John is talking about Jesus coming back in the Holy Ghost, in the, the Spirit of God that he was born of. He was going to make it possible that man could be born of that same nature of God being born again by the and through the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And um, so uh, he came, here's what he said in, in St. John 14, he said, concerning the Holy Ghost, or the, uh, which is the, com the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost that he's going to send to them. He said, he has been with you, but he shall be in you. Talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then he said, 
in that day, thou shall know that I am in the Father and he in me. Because he said, my Father and I will come to you and make our abode with you. And he said, uh, my Father will be in me, I'm in him, and we in you. Uh, when you're born of God, you'll know it. You'll know that you'll understand how that God was in Christ when he was here on this earth. The same way God's in you through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's, that's a, a witness. That's a testimony, a witness to you that you are God's child. And uh, so that was a harvest. Now, um, down here in the end of the Gentile world, we don't have uh, scriptures. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe that we have any scriptures that has to do with harvest. Um, except in Revelations, Revelations, the 14th chapter, it does state that um, uh, the 15th verse, it says, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice. Remember, John saw one like a, uh, like unto the son of man, sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand, golden crown on his head. And then the next verse said, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice uh, to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So God's going to harvest this, the Gentile world and the end of the Gentile world the same way that he harvested that church back there. That's why we, we're we looking for a restored church. We're looking for a church just like that early church that will accomplish what that early church accomplished. So here in, in uh, Psalms, the 19th chapter, let's read a little bit of it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, you could take this natural because what is natural as far as the, if you look up into the sky and see the moon and the sun and the stars and and the clouds and, you know, the, hev the natural heavens, that does declare God's glory. I mean, who, what, what a creation that God's created. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, but but uh, prophetically or typically, allegorically, an allegory is a picture that uh, that uh, manifests something to you about God. The heavens here it's talking about is the early church, the New Testament church, and the restored church down here, and the firmament shows his handiwork that that. Uh, the presence of God, the, uh, and day to day uttereth speech. The word of God is is continually revealing during a when the divine order, when the early church came on the day of Pentecost. That church existed for uh, over forty years, a forty five year period, and it. It's going to exist 45 years down here. Um, and it's going to, and that's all called a day of the Lord. And night unto night showeth knowledge. See, even during the dark ages, even during dark times, remember the Apostle Paul said, we see through a glass darkly. Even in, in the darkness are things that we don't understand about God while we're waiting for God's uh, revealing uh, witness of the truth of God's word, there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world and them as he said, a tabernacle for the sun. And that's talking about where God, you know, see the, the S-U-N, sun, uh, this direction over here where I live is east. The sun comes up in the morning. That's a picture of Jesus coming in the end of the world at his coming when he begins to rise. And that's called a day of the Lord. 
the sun comes up and of course it goes down in the west but the god will do his work and he'll close on that dispensation and finish in that work of the lord uh, and so it's the end of the world that god's dealing with the world the part of the world that god's dealing with god's not dealing with everything right now uh, the there still will be a millennial reign a thousand years that god will deal with nations Right now, God's dealing with the United States of America. That's where he restored his church, or he's, he is restoring it. That's where he chose to finish the restoration. The Protestant movement started uh, back in the East. <clears throat> you know, uh, Martin Luther was in Germany, and uh, but uh, Catholicism ruled the world back there, and our forefathers came to America for freedom of religion, to get freedom. Uh, and of course, they started our uh, nation uh, and made sure that our uh, constitution included separation of church and state. They did not want government to have anything to do with ruling over God's church. And so the Protestant movement brought us to where we are. And then, of course, the Pentecostal movement was brought into existence in the United States. And then God has been restoring his church ever since. And he's still working on that. And finally, the brightness of his coming. Jesus is finally going to come with a bright light. Here this says in verse 5 that... Uh, he set a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chambers. Jesus is coming out of his, he's coming out of heaven and rejoicing as a strong man to run a, run a race. His going forth is um, from the end of the heaven and his circuit to the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And so Jesus is coming and uh, as a bridegroom to receive his bride. He's going to make up his bride before it's over with. Then look, here's a part I want to get to. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So if you go back to the law of Moses and you look at that law, you know, I've, I've taught where the first four commandments of the law had to do with our relationship with God, and the last six has to do with our relationship with one another. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. Uh, thou shalt not make any graven image or any idol. Uh, thou shalt not take the Lord God's name in vain. That's not talking about, by the way, uh, it's not talking about taking, you know, using a curse word, using God's name in a curse word. That's uh, that's shallow compared to what he's actually meaning here. He's talking about when vanity. He's talking about when you use God's name to benefit yourself instead of really glorifying Him. Your, your His name is is a high tower. His name is higher than any other name, and it's to be glorified, it's to be feared, it's to be held in awe. And so he said, don't take my name in vain, uh, and then keep the Sabbath day holy. Enter into God's rest. Uh, God finished his, his work in six days, and the seventh day rested. God's work was finished. He finished his work even though it, it hadn't been fulfilled, when God set it in order, it was a finished work and it would come to pass. Well, we've got to enter into God's finished work, which has to do with Christ coming to this world and finishing uh, his work in us. Um, I talked to a man this week that... that um, 
wanted to apply the work of Christ, that it, it, he's done everything. There's nothing we can do. We can't be righteous until we get to heaven. You know, we'll never be righteous till we get to heaven. I said, well, you know, what's going to make us righteous when we get to heaven? I mean, God would have to change your mind, you know, because you your character is who you are. So I asked him about the scripture, about us going on to perfection. And I asked him about the scripture in first, uh, I mean, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, where it said, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers until uh, for the perfecting of the saints. I said, if we can't be perfected, that word perfected means made mature to where we come, listen to the rest of the scripture. Um, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the to a perfect man, to the fullness of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus, that we be no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, whereby men lie in wait to deceive. If if that scripture says he gave a fivefold ministry, gifted men that were gifted spiritual gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ until we all come to a perfect man, to the fullness of the stature of Christ Jesus, if that scripture is not saying that we're to be like him. John said in 1 John that every man that has this hope uh, should be like him, should walk even as he walked. How are you going to walk as he walked if, if you don't live above sin? God, he said, you believe that? I said, sure, I believe it's biblical. I believe in the impossible. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And, and God's going to do it in us. It's not our power or our strength or our wisdom, but it's God working in us that is, it's just like that scripture we read about Jesus, that he was given the oil of gladness, you know, that it made him glad. Uh, the understanding of God's word. Once God helps you to understand it, listen to this scripture. I've been quoting it here of late. In Job 28, verse 28, Job said this. He said, the fear of God is wisdom and understanding is to depart from evil. Think about that. That what here's what wisdom is is to fear god and to to really put god have a reverence for god where he is the the utmost focus of your life he's on the front burner so to speak he has first place in your life he's not a afterthought he's not i'll get around to god if i get around to god he's not you know i'll be faithful if you know uh, whenever I can be faithful, but, you know, uh, my will comes first. See, there's a lot of people like that. I've, I've met a lot of people, families. I've met families where, where family is more important to them than God and the things of God. Listen to this scripture. This is a hard scripture to identify with. Jesus said, as many as hated houses and lands, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, for my sake, will I give a hundredfold in this life plus and, and life forevermore. Uh, it doesn't mean that God wants you to hate your family or hate your house or your land, but what it means is, is that God wants you that nothing will come between you and God. If your family tries to turn you away from God, you won't turn. You would you would depart from your family before you would depart from God. You'd depart from your land. 
you know, Abraham, God told him, get up and get out of the country. He left everything that there was and followed God in faith. You know, you, you've got to be, you know, God has to be foremost in your life above everything. And so, uh, you know, it has to be above. It has to be above your home, above your job, above your, above everything, above your wife, your children. You you can't put anything above God. God has to be foremost. That 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 is wisdom. And then departing from evil. That's understanding. To to have the understanding that what I know about God is I can't. I've got to get evil out of my life. Um, anyway, so the law of God is perfect, converting the soul. That, that Those Ten Commandments, that isn't do's and don'ts. That is God's character. It's a, it, he is, gave it to us. He gave it to the Old Covenant because there was no way they weren't born again. There's no way they could keep it, but at least they could examine it. They could try to hold to it. It was, it converted the soul to understand what, you know, what was wrong, what was right. I've tried to tell people down here uh, that's under my ministry that if you're keeping a law, you know, rules, and they are necessary. Let's read just a little bit further and I'll say more about that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. See, the testimony, that's the witness of God, his presence, the acts. You know, Paul, he came in power and demonstration of the spirit. That was a testimony, a wis wisdom. Jesus said, there's another that bears witness of me, testifies of me. That that makes wise the simple. If you're the simple, that's humble. To be humble enough that when you see God's works and you feel his spirit, that that's a testimony. That's a witness of God's presence. Uh, the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is, is his, his personal presence. That is, man, I'd hate to serve a God I couldn't feel. I couldn't see any of his works. Couldn't feel his spirit. I don't think I could follow religion like that. But this God you can feel. You can, he'll manifest himself. There is a testimony or a witness of him in his works. I love it when we have church and the spirit of God comes in and just bathes us in the precious, deep, manifestation of his presence, his spirit. Then the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. There you go. The statutes, that's principles. Those are ordinances. There were 613 ordinances that all applied to those 10 commandments. They were rules, principles, statutes, precepts that you had to maintain under the law. You had to keep those rules. We don't have those exact rules, but we do have principles. We do have rules. We've got an order here in the body of Jesus Christ. Um, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. These, those commandments, see, they're, they're pure. There, uh, there's not any ill motive in them whatsoever. It's it's uh, wisdom from above is first pure. James said, and so uh, there's an order of God that uh, we have to learn how to to walk in His order. See the. Uh, James said this, he said, humble yourself. That's this simple, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in, in due season. Now that's talking about 
uh, humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. That's God's ministry. We know God's hand, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. That's God's hand, the fivefold ministry. And uh, Peter said, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. There were, there were, there were uh, 12 apostles in that early church. The number 12 is a number of government. That was God's government of those 12 men that God chose. And then everything in the body of Christ and the ministry were under those 12 men. Later, the Gentiles were added in. God called the apostle Paul to be over the Gentile work. You say, well, why was there just one apostle? Because that was that one apostle just brought the Gentiles in. He wasn't going to be the apostle for 2,000 years, this Gentile world. It just, it just introduced the gospel. God, when he finished his harvest of that world, he left off from the Jewish world. He judged it because everyone that didn't hearken to that harvest turned against him and he couldn't get anybody else out. So he judged it in AD 70. God judged that world and he, he judged Israel. And then he, he left Israel and went to the Gentiles. And, but that was a new world. That was a new 2000 year world. That's why we're down here in 2021. That started back there in AD 33 or thereabouts. Uh, and so here we're, what are we, 12 years away from a 2000 year world. Somewhere in this time frame, God is coming again in a restored church, and then the last prophetical hour, which is a 15-year period, God is going to finish his work, make up the remainder of his bride, and he'll judge this world. This world will be, this world will be judged in the Battle of Armageddon. We'll finish this, the judgment on the Gentile world, and then God will turn to the rest of the world called the millennial reign. He'll, he will graft the Jews back in and there'll be a Jewish ministry that'll receive our mantle before the end of this world, just like the Gentiles came in and received their mantle before the end of the Jewish world. And, and a Gentile ministry has, has worked down through these 2000 years to bring us to where we're at. But God hadn't finished his work with us yet. We're not we haven't established. Um, we haven't established heaven hadn't been opened as far as we haven't established the holy place. Now those are just types. The the outer court. Remember, uh, the early church taught us that the temple is no longer a physical structure, but it's the church. It's the church, and but that church did fall away and its order, that holy place fell away. The only thing left was the outer court for 1260 years trodden underfoot before God was able to start a reformation to begin to reform or restore a restoration of the early church. And down all down through the Protestant movement, God's been restoring the church. The Pentecostal movement restored it further but we've got to go beyond the Pentecostal movement. It's got to be the body of Christ, one body, one spirit, one faith, God's people drawn into that. That early church back there, those 12 apostles were the chief leaders and the order. See, we can't follow the order of Babylon where they, you know, hire preachers and fire them and they have, uh, that government is a democratic government that's set up out there. And I know God permitted it. He had permitted it for a long time to protect the saints. It's why is because those, because of the dictation of Catholicism that had to be escaped. And then God has to have men. Look at the picture when Mary had Jesus. Uh, remember what the angel told Joseph? 
don't you touch that woman, Mary, until this child is born. That's a charge. There's a picture in that, a charge to God's ministry, that Mary's a picture of the church, and we're to bring forth the likeness of Christ in the man-child that's to be born. That's just another picture of the bride of Christ that will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But we are not to touch this church with our seed or with our uh, desires, with our will, with our uh, doctrine. But we're to watch over this church and minister and serve this church until this promised child is born. There's to be a child born of God, the bride of Jesus Christ, a man child is called also. Um, the 12th chapter of Revelation shows that it was a man child. And so and that's just a different picture for, uh, for those that overcome sin and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And so there's an order. There's an order of God that those 12 apostles, they were over. Everyone humbled themselves under that ministry. Well, we've got to have a ministry that won't hurt anybody. We've got to have a ministry that is tender. First, it has to be pure. It's got to be easy. It's got to be tender and easy to be treated, uh, full of mercy. We, we've got to have a ministry from that, that God is, has uh, developed for this work that has no ill motive in it or no self-gain motive in it, but servants. He that's greatest among you, Jesus said, let him be your servant. And so uh, let me read a little more here. Verse nine says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. See, the, if you fear God, you, you'll get clean, sanctified, set apart for him. The judgments are the, of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. In other words, the judgment God's gonna put you in, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey, and the honeycomb. Psalm Solomon said in Proverbs, he said, Hast thou found honey? Eat so much of it is sufficient for thee, lest thou vomit it. That's how rich the word of God is. You, you can't, you cannot get all of this in one meal. You can't, you know, there's no way, it's too way too rich. You cannot digest all of this. As a matter of fact, it'll make the flesh sick. You can only take so much of it at a time when you start out for God. You have to mature to where you can handle more and more of it, uh, you know, and uh, you're able, you, you've finally developed a digestive system spiritually, uh, digested in your mind, in your body. <clears throat> you know, you can, I've seen people when they, get such a great touch from God, make them sick, go to coffin and just their body can't endure uh, a too deep of a touch of God, the brokenness that God can work in their life. It takes time for God to, for you to be able to house God in your, in your, uh, in your life and your body, your mind, even your emotions. Um, Moreover, by them is the servant warmed, and in the keeping of them is great reward. So that, uh, that great reward is life eternal, everlasting life. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. See, there's things in you that keep me back from presumptuous sins. Those presumptuous sins, that's talking about pride, arrogancy. Uh, Brother Linegar brought to this body years ago, uh, he said, we cannot be proud about nothing. There's no, we're, we're not able to have pride in our life. 
He said, you ought to get it out of your life and not be saying, I'm proud of this or I'm proud of that. And not even I'm proud of uh, uh, the um, my children, for an example. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you can't be proud. You have to say, I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful that they're doing as well in school as they're doing. I'm not proud. I'm not proud of their talents. I'm thankful that God's blessed them. I'm glad. I'm thankful. You, you start doing that and, and get get that word proud out of your life and see if see if it don't mean something to you. You'll you'll begin to realize in your heart there is something to this proud spirit. There's something to see because when you're proud, that's selfishness. That's when you begin to claim everything for yourself. You know, I'm proud. You know, I'm arrogant. I've done something. Uh, you know, they're mine because, and they do what they do because, you know, we're great. We're a great family. No, there's nothing great about us except what God's done in our lives. We're nothing but filthy rags until God got a hold of her life. I don't like for a Christian to be saying I'm a nobody because uh, when God gets a hold of you and starts working in your life, working his righteous in your life, you are somebody. Let's see, question. Some say all the apostles we need are those in the early reign church. No, that's not true. We, we're going to have to have an apostolic ministry down here. If God's going to restore the church, we can't, we, as, as a matter of fact, we don't know hardly anything that we know very little about James. We know more about John. We know more about Peter, the chief apostle. We know very little about Philip, the apostle Philip. Andrew was Peter's brother. Uh, we know very little about, uh, uh, help me with their names, Thaddeus, uh, Bartholomew. What do you know about Bartholomew and Thaddeus? See, what, how can those apostles minister to your life? Because we know very little about what took place among the Jews. We know more about what Paul did among the Gentiles because that applies to us. We do have a history in the first seven or eight chapters of Acts of what part of what took place in that early church. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus. Um, uh, you know, we don't know too much about some of these men. We got very little knowledge of them. What we have mostly knowledge of is the apostle Paul. He is apostle to the Gentiles and he's been more help to us. Peter did some ministering to the Gentiles after Paul died. Uh, John also carried on because he was the last apostle. He had to carry on those works after AD 70 or up until AD 70, right in the very end. And so he ministered to several of, of Paul's works because the, the Jews and Paul's works became partly one as they fled from Jerusalem and Israel and went, it, went into Asia into Paul's works. But uh, now we'll have to have firstly apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. We'll have to have an apostolic ministry that can accomplish the same thing. See, a lot of people don't understand an apostolic gift. An apostle is a man that when when the when the apostle Paul started out, he started out as a as an evangelist. It's the only gift that involves from and all and holds all five gifts. But look at Paul's life. When he started his missionary work, he'd go into a city and evangelize with men, with the spirit of might the power, demonstration of the Spirit of God, miracles, work, workings of the Spirit, people getting blessed, healings and miracles taking place. He would woo a woman. And then after a time, he'd marry a woman. And it would start a spiritual family. He was, he was in Christ's stead there, the father of that work. 
And then they would have children, spiritual children. That's the people, the people of God that were born to the spirit in that church. Now he's, he's, he's not doing as, as much now as a work of an evangelist as he is a pastor, a shepherd. He's, you can't, you can't live on love. When you first get married, you're going to have to get out and be a breadwinner for the family. And so that, he became a teacher. He had to teach. He had to bring home spiritual food for the, for his wife and children, spiritually I'm talking about. But then as those children got bigger and grew bigger, he began to realize these children can't live on today's bread. They're going to have to know something about the future of what they're going to face when they grow up as, as adults and begin to face this world out here. And he had to develop a prophetical gift, a prophet, to cause them to fear God and to know how to serve God and face the world of what's going to happen out here. They need to know something about the future and God's judgments concerning what they would run into in their adulthood. And then finally, he became, a, he had an administration. He had an administration of all of his, uh, of all what God called him to do and all the churches that he uh, developed, he was sent to, to develop. And so then God, look, the apostles, this thumb, the extension of that thumb, thumb is these four fingers. That's the rest of the hand. That's an extension of an apostolic gift. You see how he can cover every one of them fingers. He can cover it, evangelist, pastor, teacher, prophet. He can do all those works. But when he's got an administration, he needs help. These men are like specialists. He needs pastors over works that he's over and that he's established. He needs evangelists to go among them and and uh, uh, evangelize the new the newcomers that comes into it. He 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 needs teachers to be able to teach. Some men have more than one gift. Some men are gifts. Some gifts are received severally as he will. Some men are pastors. They're also teachers. Some men are evangelists and they're also pastors or teachers. Some men have a prophetical gift. They may be a pastor too, but uh, Brother Ray Lineker was, a, was one of the greatest prophets that we've ever had among us. Outside of Brother William Souders, I'd say he's the greatest prophet we've had because, uh, and prophets deal, that's the spirit of, uh, the fear of the Lord. That's judgment. You listen to Brother Leninger prophesy, listen to him teach. Uh, he would bring judgment, but he'd also draw the, the future up so close that make you feel like it's coming right upon us and you better straighten up. You'd get, you listen to him preach and you'd get the fear of God put in you. You'd think, I'm, I got to straighten up and get my life straightened up. Because he'd bring, you, you know, the, the judgment of God would be facing you. That's what a prophet's gift will do. A teacher fills in all of the details. Uh, an apostle de mainly deals with the big picture. And then he's got men that, that you know, uh, a, a pastor, that's the spirit of counsel. A pastor will break down the apostolic doctrine and give you counsel of God's word and how to apply it to your everyday life. Those are counselors, wonderful counselors, a pastor, a pastor that's got a pastor's heart and has shepherd God's people. See, but uh, the spirit of might is an evangelist. We, we've not had evangelists like that hardly. You'll see them in the restored church, but we'll have to have an apostle. We're going to have to have apostolic ministry that oversees the ministry just like that early church apostolic ministry did. God will choose out men. Uh, they'll be men like those early church men. Their, their shadows will heal people, work miracles. They pray for somebody, they'll get healed. It won't be hit and hit, miss. Those men will have it. They'll have the answers of doctrine for us. We won't question them. When, when somebody lies to one of those men, 
lying to the Holy Ghost and, and people fall dead, like Ananias and Sapphira, you'll pay better attention. So there's, there's uh, we, we'll have to have an apostolic ministry. There's no question in my mind. Why would we say we, we need a five-fold ministry and we're going to leave off the number one position that oversees it all? Those are the men, these, these, these statutes I was talking about. Our leading ministry right now is replacing an apostolic ministry. We've got some apostles. I think we've got all five gifts working right now, but not to the same level of the early church. I don't think we've got a holy place, sevenfold like where those seven spirits of God are. I'm sorry if men don't agree with me, but I still believe that the spirit of the Lord is the spirit of God the Father. Um, I still believe that wisdom is, is Christ. I still believe that uh, the, you know, I'll, I'll put it in maybe order here. Uh, I still believe that the, uh, well, if you want to just look at the 11th chapter of Isaiah right quick, I know I'm going to have to get off here, but <clears throat> this is, you know, it says uh, at verse first, there'll come a, a, a rod, a come forth out of the stem of Jesse and a branch and grow out of his roots. That's Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Here's the spirit, seven spirits of God. Jesus had all seven spirits and he was an apostle of our faith. The Bible calls him an apostle. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's the spirit of the father. And the spirit of wisdom, that he is the wisdom. Read uh, 1 Corinthians verse uh, chapter 1, verse 29. He's the wisdom of God and the man. And then understanding, that is an apostolic gift that works in bringing understanding of God's plan. And then every other minister works from the apostolic doctrine. That's what the 12 loaves of unleavened bread is. It's the, the doctrine of the 12 apostles has no leaven in it. That's the, gee, Paul told the Romans, he said, I would, I would that I could come and impart unto you some spiritual gift whereby you might be established. So, uh, Proverbs 24 says that by wisdom, a house is built. That's Christ. And by understanding, it is established. See, that gift of understanding establishes. And by Knowledge, teachers, its chambers are filled with great riches. So, and then the spirit of counsel, there's the pastor, and might, there's the evangelist. You say, well, why would the little, why would evangelist, the little finger, have so much power? Well, look what, go look what Philip did when he went to Samaria. We don't have evangelists like that today, but we will have in a restored church. The spirit of knowledge. That's a teacher. And the fear of the Lord, that's a prophet. As I said, I still see those seven gifts operating there. And for us to have a holy place, a restored church, we're going to have to have a holy place. Sevenfold light, 12 loaves of unleavened bread. Like I said, you, you can't borrow from those 12 men. That was back there. And everything that applied back there don't apply down here. It's different. It's a different world, different culture, different society. But uh, we're going to have to have the same workings. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Anyway, let's go back to uh, Psalms 19 now. There, there's a song that we used to sing in the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. I wish I could sing that for you right now. Um, anyway, uh, keep back thy servant, verse 13, from his presumptuous sins. Uh, that, 
that's arrogancy. That's that's sins of having an arrogant or self uh, selfish sins, uh, putting yourself up too high in in pride. Let them have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I'll be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Praise God. Well, saints, it's good to, you know, I love the word of God. And and uh, I was going to say earlier that these uh, chief men, right now we have chief leaders in the body of Christ. That's who we have to humble under. Those men do... Uh, they set forth the order. See, there's an order among them. They're to submit to one another, but the younger to submit to the elder. That's talking about the elders in position, firstly apostles, secondarily prophets. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a ministry today, and uh, those elders are the ones that have put forth, uh, they've put forth, statutes, principles, rules. I've said you'll, a rule won't make you perfect, but you won't get perfect without it because you're going to have to have a rule to hold your flesh down and you're going to have to understand the purpose behind the rule, behind the standard. It's a standard. I don't care if it's a dress standard or standard of behavior. They're principles to follow in your life and our Forefathers, our, our chief men, has set those standards up, those standards of living, and we're not to violate those standards. Uh, those men, you know, God may do things to our leadership to cause them to make changes. Some standards of principles, uh, you know, they may they may need adjustment. Some of the things that we've had to that we've put forth may need adjust adjusted, but not a younger man, not a man that doesn't have a voice of authority yet should try to handle that. He's trying to handle too much. He's trying to take on too much. You know, we've always had men ever since I've been here in the body of Christ. I can remember a man by the name of Big Mac. I remember a name one uh, name of Brother McClintock. Others that have been boisterous. Uh, they've been bold. They've they've bullied their way in, but they didn't have a voice. Our 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 leaders put on charity. Our leaders were patient. They they let them have a place. One of the things that they did, they were a perfect example of what not to do, of how you could, if you try to force your voice, you won't have one. Perfect example of working out of God's order, the order of his ministry, the order of his leadership. We've always had a, a man or at least, at least one, if not more, that was so bold, that tried to push themselves and it always charged the ministry because they always got set down or nobody listened to them, but they never did. They never did understand the order of God's ministry. They never did understand that it wasn't their place to try to, you know, Brother Clyde Patton used to talk. He used to get up to a meeting and talk and I'd listen to him. And I'd think, I think, I know everything he just got through saying. He just talked an hour and I, know, I knew all that. But then I'd think, but I don't, I can't do what he does. I don't have a voice. I don't have the authority to do what he does. When he talks, people listen. If I talk, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't hear what I was saying. That's because his character was developed as a leader before God used him and used his voice as a voice of influence and leadership to serve God's people and to keep God's people in line with God's purpose. See, and we have to learn how to quit ourselves like men and know our place in the body of Christ. Brother Patton used to say, you know, <clears throat> it, it matters where you sit in a church. It matters where you sit in a meeting as a minister. 
mean, you, you, when you're young, you may sit back on the back pew and play tip-tap-toe with somebody, you know, because that's where you belong. But when God moves you up, you, you, you can sit too far back. No, you're sitting too far back. You can also sit too close up. See, and take too high of a seat when somebody else belongs in that high seat. And, and you, you cannot realize that I, this isn't where I belong. I'm not, I'm not qualified. I don't have a voice to be right here. So in a little while, you'll find the proper place for where you fit in the body of Christ. It's the same when in early, in, in a, in a, in a church. Your function in the church, you, you, we have to develop. And God has to promote us. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he, that's the ministry, and he, God, will promote you in due season. God will raise you up if you're worthy to be raised up. Anyway, God bless your hearts. It's good to be in service with you again tonight in these, uh, uh, these broadcasts. You know, I never would have dreamed we'd have been we would have been doing this kind of thing, not even a year ago or two. But this is where God's got us right now, and we're we're having to learn something from it. We may have online churches before it's over with. In fact, if any of you want to become now, I'm talking to somebody else's saint in the body. If somebody don't have a church and you want me for your pastor. I, I want to be your pastor. I want to help you the things of God. You can be a part of, of, of this online ministry. You can pay your tithes, give your offerings, and help edify and build the body of Jesus Christ in this world. I'm not talking about for man to spend for his own, his own glory, but I'm talking about building the kingdom of heaven. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Have a good night. Uh, the local church here in Little Rock. I'll see you Sunday morning. Breakfast at 9.30 in the dining room. Bible study at 10. Band practice at 11.30. I mean 11 and, and uh, church at 11.30. See you then. God bless you and good night. I'm going to look just a minute for a Click us off and see if anybody tells me something I need to be saying that I hadn't said. Now, it's always good. Sister Betty Layton, it's good to have you always. She, she lives in Winters, Texas. She's one of my first saints in Winters, Texas, new saints that came in there. I've always appreciated her and her sister, Tansy. Her, not her sister, but her daughter, Sister Tansy. God bless their hearts. I pray for you. Uh, it's good to have Brother Pastor Clyde Quick from uh, where? where is that at? Chaffee, Missouri. We're glad to have him. The Hill Church. Good to see you, Brother Quick. Oh, there's others. Brother Potus from uh, Brother, Brother Fidel from uh, Guatemala, Guatemala City is on here. Brother Potus from the Philippines. God bless your heart, Brother Potus. It's good to have you with us tonight. Sister Yvonne York. There's one of my, there's one of my first saints, her and her husband, Doug York. When I was in Babylon, they became my saints. I've loaned them out right now, but I still claim them. <laughs> All right. God bless your heart. I will see you Sunday. Those that are local, God bless your hearts. Pray for me and I'll 